Good afternoon. Welcome to the Dakota Lakes Virtual Field Day for uh, 2020. We normally like to do this in person. Unfortunately, this year uh, we're not able to. So this, this photo kind of shows you what it should look like. Actually, the weather's quite good here right now, uh, but there's some storms around us, so maybe we're better off doing it this way. Uh, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we wish to see you again in the future. Coal Lakes Research Farm is 17 miles east of Pier along Highway 34, but just as importantly along the Missouri River. This is our main station. We have a, another site to the north, uh, five miles. Uh, one of the things we're, we talk about doing is developing a learning community where the groups of farmers that we work with, uh, the farmers that own the farm, have been working together for uh, 40 years at least. The farm has been in existence for 30. But it's a, a community where they, we, we learn from each other and we learn from the university. Uh, our, our research staff is uh, me, Dr. Dwayne Beck, Dr. Cody Zilberberg, who is a consultant that works for, directly for the board of directors, and he's our animal science, range science guy. We have two technicians right at this time. Uh, Gary Walk is, is a, the research manager, and John Neff is, is a technician. James Hicks has been with us for uh, a number of years, but he's retired as of April. And then our senior secretary is, Sam, is Sarah Doisler. Uh, we have three graduate students this summer. Sam Ireland, uh, he's in his second year finishing his master's. He'll be a speaker today. Uh, Brendan Lewis, you'll see a photo of him. He's taking over the work on the foster study, which we'll talk about today. And then uh, Brennan comes from Minnesota and SDSU. And Natalie Sturm is from Illinois by way of uh, Montana State University. She's in her first year as well. Uh, things we're not going to talk to, about today, winter wheat breeding, for instance, spring wheat breeding, oats breeding, some of those things, variety testing. Pea varieties, uh, we don't have time. I know that the uh, variety testing people are having a Zoom webinar of their own, so I would advise you to check with Extension and, and see when that's gonna be happening. We also have a lot of other things going on, but we have to kind of limit what we do today. There's a group of videos that is up that you probably have a link to. They're excellent, they've done, done very well. And a lot of our presentations today just kind of direct you toward those videos that really give you the real feel of what would have gone on today here if you'd have been here. So there's a variety uh, testing thing. They do a lot of mowing. <laughs> the wheat's not that uh, ripe. This is from a year or so ago. But again, that's going to be on its own webinar. Uh, <clears throat> the the Presentations today at, at 3.15, uh, Sam Ireland will be talking about his project that he's doing with John McMain uh, on using a drone and ET equations to try to figure out what exactly is happening with water when you grow a cover crop. If we wait to plant a cover crop until we think we have enough water, we usually don't get much growth. So we think the best idea is to plant right behind the combine and then try to determine whether you need to kill it or not. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the phosphorus fertilizer project and that's a very intense project so we're just going to get the very tops of that, the ideas, but it's very intense and very important project. Cody Zilberberg is going to handle the livestock uh, integration and restoring native species things. That's being done uh, through help from the Buffett Foundation. That grant they gave us a number of years ago is funding some of this. Uh, NRCS is involved and Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And then at the end, we're gonna take a look at our long-term rotations. The, the, the videos that they have up of the long-term rotations are excellent. They show you things that you really can only see in person usually. And it really did a good job. They did an excellent job of, of capturing that. Uh, <clears throat> special thanks to the DLRF Corporation 
Uh, they sponsor and are behind a lot of what we do. Uh, my wife, Ruth Beck, has, has played an integral role here for years and, and helps really support what we're doing. The Extension Media Group, who did the, the filming, and of course, SDSU Ag Experiment Station and, and, and uh, College of, of, of Food and Agriculture. This is a view from uh, the river, just the river bank, just to the south of our farm. This is where uh, Lewis would have walked when Lewis and Clark came through. I suspect this right here looks very different, not much different from what Lewis found. And if you read his journals, other than that river valley where we see the water would have been filled with trees. And this is a Maximilian sunflower if you've never seen one. So. Uh, have a good time today. We we are glad that you're here. Okay, well, if I can start this off, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Charlie Edinger. I'm a farmer from Mitchell. And on behalf of the Board of Directors at Dakota Lakes, I would like to welcome you to the first ever virtual summer tour. No offense, but I hope it is the last. I say that because it is, it is much better to be here in person and see what we're up to. And I guess for those that have never been here, this is kind of an opportunity to get a taste of what the farm is like. I hope that you can come for a visit someday when it is safe to do so. For all the others that have been here before, thanks again for joining us. We are a unique farm with strong ties to SDSU. We have been partnered from the beginning and look forward to continuing a long lasting relationship well into the future. As you can see, we are centrally located in the states along the Missouri River, nestled between the seven other SDSU research stations that are located in the state. I guess what makes our farm unique, our research farm unique, is that we are owned and directed by farmers. And from what I understand, there's one, only one other research farm like it in the country, and we're fortunate that that is here in our own state of South Dakota down at Beersford. At Dakota Lakes, our facilities, the land, and much of the irrigation equipment is owned by the corporation. And there is an 11 member board of directors that works with the farm manager to operate the production enterprise. The research manager works with the board of directors and SDSU to operate the research enterprise. And here's a, the mission statement. It's a very long mission statement for a short worded person, but the Dakota Lakes Research Farm is to have as its primary mission the conducting of projects designed to research, identify, and demonstrate to its members and the community as a whole the best methods of stabilizing the agricultural economy through promoting agricultural diversity, increasing production efficiency, minimizing negative environmental effects, maintaining soil productivity, and developing techniques to mitigate biological stress effects. Many years ago, we sat down for a two day planning session. Um, and we came up with many goals. Amongst them are to achieve financial independence. And basically we wanna do that to make us stronger to weather any storms that may arise. Second goal was a succession plan. Dwayne has been basically telling us for years that he's gonna eventually retire. Well, unfortunately that time is coming and we are in the search for a new research manager. And we are very, very happy to be able to take part with SDSU. Um, we've got two members that are on the search committee for a new research manager. And we are also fortunate that SDSU is allowing us to hire this person before Dwayne officially retires so that we can have a smooth transition. Another goal is relationship with, our, with SDSU. Um, as far as fostering it and nurturing it throughout all this time. Goal four is integrating livestock into our cropping system. We've actually been doing that last several years and we're conducting research with livestock that will be of great use to our area. Goal number five is branding, certification and marketing. And that goal has been a little bit slow to progress. The thought is to brand our products or some products using our environmentally friendly farming methods to capture value from consumers that really are concerned about their health and their environment. Goal six is zero net energy. 
And this is also a challenge to make our farm carbon neutral. As farmers, we are energy producers. Why not produce energy for the farm as well as food to try and eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels? We have been cold pressing oils for many years now and it, it is our goal to eventually use these oils to burn in tractors or equipment on the, on the farm, whether it be a gen set to power um, our irrigators or the bend sites. And we also hope to have solar power and wind power on the farm before too long. Also, one of our last goals is one that we've been consistently looking at doing, and that is trying to obtain more soil, uh, glacial soils, to better represent the soil types in the area and assist reaching some of the priorly listed goals. Our base, our districts, there's five of them in, in central South Dakota, listed uh, from south to north, one through five. Um, basically, if you don't live in a district, that doesn't mean you can't be a member. We encourage anybody to become a member. Um, it's only $100 and it's a lifetime membership. As far as our board of directors, we've got uh, one board of director from each district and then there's six at-large members. And a little fun fact for you is I'm the only board member that does not live in one of the districts. So. Um, Chet. Okay, sorry about that, had an interruption. Um, this is a photo of the research farm that you've seen Dwayne just presents. Um, as you can see, the west side is the irrigated portion of the farm nearest the farm buildings, and uh, the west side is the dry land rotation. And as Dwayne mentioned, five miles to the north, we have another dry land uh, cropping system up there. As far as the impacts Dakota Lakes has had, we've had a tremendous impact on central South Dakota. When you compare the increased bushels produced due, due to increased no-till and management practices stemming from this farm, it's incredible at, at the amount of bushels that we can produce with our rainfall. People used to joke about how South Dakota really doesn't, ma doesn't matter when it comes to marketing their grain. Now, people across the nation know that South Dakota does count. We do matter. We, do, we are able to produce a lot of crop here. As far as our environmental impact, um, Dakota Lakes was initially um, formed as an irrigation farm. And through no-till, diversity, and intensity, it didn't take long to get water to go in through the soil instead of running off the, across the surface. We found ways to keep the soil covered to prevent all forms of erosion. We use regenerative practices to heal and improve our soil health so we don't need as many inputs to raise a good crop. And as we look ahead, with all the uncertainty out there, we will remain focused in our goals to keep moving this farm or making this farm a success by providing great research that will benefit our environments and thus generations to come. As we look back with, at our history with SDSU and see the impact that we've made, we can be really proud of what we have done. Again, thanks for participating in our virtual tour and I hope to see you in person next year. Well, hello everyone. My name is Bill Gibbons. I am the uh, director of the South Dakota Agricultural Experiment Station. I'd like to echo uh, the welcome that uh, Dwayne and Charlie provided to you. Uh, this time on behalf of SDSU and the College of Ag, Food and Environmental Sciences. Uh, as you understand, this is a, a virtual field day. Uh, it's new to all of us. This is the first uh, of many that we're going to have this summer. And so if you're interested in the coming weeks, we're going to be having field days using this format for uh, several of our other research farms and units around the state. So if you uh, look at the SDSU and Extension website, you'll be able to find details on the times and days, the agendas for those, and then links to those, uh, those field day events, virtual field day events. Uh, the info uh, that we present uh, is going to be maintained uh, accessible, as, as Ruth and Duane mentioned, for you to view uh, in, in future weeks and months. Uh, maybe this winter uh, when you come back in from working cattle and it's uh, 20 below and you pull up your uh, your cup of coffee, your cocoa, you can pull up uh, this summer event and look back and see what the, the nice green fields look like and uh, blue skies. 
one thing we would ask is if, if you have any questions, uh, make sure you use the, the chat or the question feature. Um, and if you have suggestions for how we might improve these virtual field days, make sure you share that with us because we want to, uh, to make these very productive and useful for you. Again, thanks for joining us. We hope you learn a lot during the, uh, uh, during the uh, event here today and our future ones. And, and we hope that the information you learn will benefit you uh, personally and in your operations. So again, welcome and hope you, uh, you learn a lot today and enjoy it. My name is Sam Ireland. I'm a graduate research assistant at SDSU. And this is my second summer doing research at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And the project that I'm working on is the influence of cover crops on water and nutrient cycles in South Dakota. And so the aerial image that you can see there was taken last fall of our cover crop plots. And uh, up and down, we have our, our different mixes that were planted and the controls that we had were our wheat stubble where it's kind of brown through there and then the the brown yellow rectangles that are scattered throughout the plots were our terminations that we we had that we had in the fall and we'll talk a little bit about our rationale behind doing some of that later on in the presentation you can go to the next slide and so why do we want to use cover crops? So cover crops are a tool that we can use to match the natural water cycle as well as to cycle nutrients. And the two are, are tied closely together. So if we have water leaving the system in runoff or in leaching down through our soil profile, it's taking nutrients with it a lot of the times. And so if we can reduce the nutrients, reduce the amount of nutrients that leave our systems, that's, that's beneficial to us. So. covered. This keeps the soil cool and reduces our evaporation. And so that's, that's beneficial to retaining soil moisture as well. And so here's a map of the state showing the cover crop acres in 2019. And for those of you that are not familiar with the precipitation distribution across the state, the normal annual precipitation distribution increases from west to east. So the eastern part of the state receives more, more rainfall, more precipitation than the western and central parts of the state. So we're, we're seeing that the drier regions of the state are not having as many cover crop acres. And one of the reasons for this is that producers fear that by planting that cover crop in the fall and utilizing soil moisture throughout the fall, they're going to shortchange that following cash crop of soil moisture. And so we set up a, a study at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. You can go to the next slide. On dry land on a Dorna silt loam that holds 8.2 inches at field capacity. And the current rotation on this field is a wheat followed by corn uh, or sorghum, corn in our case, and then a cool season broadleaf. And some years we will plant a cover crop after wheat if there's adequate soil moisture. And 2019 was one of those years where we did have adequate soil moisture to plant a cover crop. And so on July 24th, we harvested wheat and planted cover crops the day after. And Dwayne talked about chasing the combine out of the field with our planter. And that's, that's a key point to take home that with the, the period of time that we have to get these cover crops established and get the benefit, we need to chase the combine out of the field with that planter. You can go to the next slide. So we planted three different cover crop mixes that contained the same eight species, just in differing amounts. We had a grass dominant blend, a broadleaf dominant blend, and then an equally weighted blend of those eight species you see and we terminated the cover crops at four different times in the fall with herbicides. And our rationale behind this is we think that we can get some of these benefits of having cover crops in the fall while still retaining some soil moisture that the cover crop might use before that last, before the killing freeze in the fall. So we can retain a little bit of soil moisture there. And a uh, part of, big part of my project has been working on a model that will help producers 
make some of these cover crop decisions as to if they should terminate their cover crops in the fall if they're running out of soil moisture or if it's going to hurt that next next crop. So it would take into account your your soil moisture after wheat harvest, your available water capacity, uh, historical precipitation, precipitation during the cover crops growing season, and then evapotranspiration. And so you can you can go to the next slide there as well. Evapotranspiration is the sum of your evaporation from the soil and transpiration through the plants that are growing. And one of the parameters in the ET equation is what's called a crop coefficient. And this is specific to one crop's water use. And there's been very little work done on, on mixed species crop coefficients. And we like to plant cover crops in mixed species to increase their diversity. And so what we're trying to do here at the farm is use remote sensing with the drone uh, to develop a vegetation index that we can use to estimate a crop coefficient to use in our evapotranspiration equation. And so a lot of my field work at the farm has been taking soil samples and trying to track the soil moisture throughout the, the cover crops growing season. And now that we have corn growing, I will continue to track that through the corn's growing season. And so we, we had a pretty wet fall this this last fall and so we didn't see a lot of differences between the different termination dates but we did see some differences between the different mixes across across each termination and so the the wheat stubble or our control had a couple more inches of plant available moisture as we might expect this spring and uh, the cover crops had a little less the broadleaf uh, mixture had a little less than the grass and the blend and this is could be due to the, the residues that come from the broadleaf heavy blend where we have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio and they decompose and go away a little quicker. And so that's something to be aware of in, in a drier region when you're planting or deciding what cover crops you're going to plant. You can go to the next slide. And so if we consider that 8.2 inch available water capacity, which is our, our field capacity, how much we can hold, and we, we think about how much we had in, on April 8th when we, when we soil sampled, but really we need to find out when we wanna be full, when we wanna be at that 8.2 inches. And it's, it's not at planting, it's when that crop is seriously using soil moisture. So for corn, maybe about that V5, V6 range. And so June 23rd, we, we hit V5. And the precipitation that we got this spring from April 8th to June 23rd was 6.7 inches. And normally we get just a little bit more than that. So if we can infiltrate all that precipitation and reduce our evaporation, uh, we have a pretty good chance at filling up our, our soil profile, even in those, those places where we have cover crops that are using some of that fall soil moisture. And another consideration is your nutrients. So our, our fall soil nitrates are shown here and in the wheat stubble or our control, we had about 60 pounds of free soil nitrate, and that's susceptible to being lost uh, to leaching or getting in, into water sources or places we just don't want it to be. And we see that the different cover crops are able to sequester some of those soil nitrates and tie them up and, and cycle those nutrients. We talked about at the beginning of the presentation that cover crops are a tool to manage the nutrient cycle, and we're seeing that our, our cover crops are doing that successfully here. I'd like to acknowledge NRCS for funding on this project and also would like to thank my graduate committee members, Dwayne Beck, Cody Zilverberg, John McMain, and Cheryl Reese. Now I'll open it up for questions. So Sam, there is a question um, asking how much soil moisture was in the soil after wheat harvest when you planted the cover crops last year? So after wheat harvest last year, we had just under an inch of plant available water. So not a significant amount, and yet we were still able to get good biomass. Uh, a wet fall helped us get some growth there as well. But like we talked about earlier with the chasing the combine, if you wait to plant those, a lot of that growth opportunity and so we think that chasing the combine, putting those cover crops in right away 
And then if we do start to run out of moisture, we can come in and terminate those with herbicides. Okay, thank you. I, I don't have any other questions right now, but if, again, if people have questions, please type them in the question and answer box. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, we're gonna talk about the phosphorus uh, uh, study at this point in time. Uh, the people involved in this is Dr. Michael Lehman from USDARS in in um, in the in Brookings at at the uh, Carl Lab north of campus there, and Brendan Lewis, who is our graduate student on this on this project. Uh, <clears throat> this is a photograph, and in, in the videos, there's some of this. There's a photograph of Brendan doing infiltrations and actually measuring. What we're doing here is measuring infiltration, uh, water runoff, quality of the water runoff, and also we're measuring what water went, went deep and then what the quality of that water is. And we asked him on the video at what uh, rate he was putting the water on in order to get runoff, and he was at 20 inches an hour. So what we're doing is really hammering the water at it to try to get to runoff. Normally, uh, last year and the year before, we, we just weren't getting enough runoff to have anything going, going to the river. Uh, nutrient movement to aquatic ecosystems is a major challenge uh, worldwide. And a lot of that has to do with phosphorus moving to, to lakes and rivers. The photograph on, on this slide is Lake Mitchell, which has an issue, but also Lake Winnipeg uh, has a big issue uh, way up north. So uh, in a lot of the small lakes in South Dakota have an issue. Nutrient management means applying uh, the nutrient in the right place at the right time in the right amount and in the right form and the four R's and that kind of is the keystone. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the main goal is to match uh, is to meet the plant's requirement for phosphorus while also minimizing the movement of peat to the aquatic ecosystem. Uh, the right amount needed to meet that requirement is dependent in all cases for every nutrient, but especially for phosphorus on the available nutrient that's there, active roots, uh, how active is your root system, and moisture, and all of these need to be in the, in the same place at the same time. And <clears throat> with, with Phosphorus, the real trick is the determining the available amount. You, Sam was talking about the nitrate test. Nitrate is pretty straightforward. It's all available. If you measure it, it's there. It's like looking at your bank account balance. Phosphorus, on the other hand, we try to estimate the solubility of phosphorus. In other words, trying to e estimate how much money you're going to make off your stocks this year, for instance. It's almost as as challenging as that sometimes because it's not a real predict predictable deal. Uh, we began doing this study basically when we came here. Uh, we're right next to the Missouri River as you saw in those early slides. So we really wanted to make sure that we were not moving things into the river. So we started to draw down our phosphorus soil tests uh, our target level was to get down to five parts per mil mil million on the Olson test. We have soils that are slightly basic, which means we use the Olson test. If we were acidic, we'd be using a bray. The rotation in the particular study we have here is a corn, corn, soybean, wheat with a cover crop following the wheat going back to soybeans. And, and we have that in five fields kind of adjacent to where the test field is. And, and then we have this in a test field. In 2014, after we'd drawn these soil tests in this field down to five parts per million, we put in five replicated strips of three different fertilizer eights, no, no additional fertilizer, 100 pounds the acre of about 100 pounds of mat per acre and 200 pounds of mat per acre. And these were applied using our no-till drill to place the material an inch and a half deep in seven half inch rows. So we're putting it under under the surface in those test area in that test area. The same rates were applied again uh, to the same strips in the fall of 2017 and 2019. Now we've grown various crops in there and we we harvested 
these trips independently over those years, but it wasn't until uh, 2018 and 19 that we really started uh, doing this study where we looked at it intensely. Uh, so here's a, here's a field, basically you see that kind of small field uh, right by the draw, that's, that's the guy. Um, it's a Lowry silt loam, the crop rotation, it says two corn, soybean, wheat, soybean. We've been no-till since 1990 here, so everything is no-till. And uh, took baseline samples in 2017 for this, for this study. Uh, we did do a companion fertilizer placement study. We actually began this in earnest in 2019. And we do this on field 2-6, which is at the same phase in that rotation as what 1-5 is, is. So we basically have a full uniform field there, whereas this one is in part of, part of the field that's nice and uniform, but it's not across the whole field. Um, winter wheat was seeded in this field in 2019, soybeans in 2020. Uh, we use the same rate of starter. We're not saying we're not going to put any fertilizer on. We're putting on a starter is all we do at planting time. It's either uh, with the seed or in proximity two inches or three inches to the side of the seed. And it depends on the crop. Uh, <clears throat> the difference in that study that's a, a, a placement study is that four of the replicated strips had the material placed in the soil with the seed in, with the wheat or to the side with the soybeans. And, and the other four strips had it broadcast at seeding time. And we actually fixed a bar up there so we could take the tubes off of the seeder and just affix them to this bar that hit a splash plate and broadcast it. Uh, this is the Olson and Bray soil test for the 2019 study. This is after we put on, uh, this is on the, on the placement study, so it's never had any extra phosphorus. This is kind of where we're running. Uh, 5.3 to 4.8, or 5.4 to 4.8 parts per million Olson. Uh, you notice the brays are very low. If you have a basic soil and do a bray, you'll get an artificially low number because uh, the lime in the soil denatures the acid they use in the bray test. Uh, we took plant samples. We haven't taken a lot of samples yet this year, so this is last year's. Uh, wheat samples. Uh, we took uh, plant samples at peak six. You notice the peak concentration is higher where we banded and and the total biomass is higher and the pea removal at peak six is is uh, way higher, three to two uh, pounds the acre. If I look at the the rate study where we did the rate study thing then <clears throat> Then the check has a, a lower P concentration, but it has a higher biomass concentration than the other treatments. And, and it matches the highest rate in terms of P uptake. And you look at that and say, well, that must be wrong. But what is really at play here is this mycorrhizal fungi population. So Mike Lehman, when we take soil samples, and take them down to Brookings and he grows them out in the greenhouse and counts the mycorrhizal fungi, he finds twice as many fungi, uh, most probable number of mycorrhizal fungi where we've put on no phosphorus. So the, the plant, if it can make a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi, it does just fine at taking up pea, even though it's very low solubility, that really low level of phosphorus in the soil. Um, Okay, so here we have a, a look at the total uh, pounds of phosphorus in parts per million. Remember at the beginning, I said what we were talking about is solubility, not quantity, whereas with nitrogen, you were looking at the quantity that's there. And using that here, in the top six inches, we've got 549 parts per million or almost 1,000 pounds. We have 1,000 pounds in the next six inches, and then basically 2,000 pounds in, in each of the next feet. So down to three foot, we're looking at 6,000 pounds of total phosphorus. It's there, it just isn't soluble, which is good news because it means it's not gonna go to the river. So the stuff that moves to the river is uh, soluble stuff, unless you got soil particles moving. 
Uh, <clears throat> if we look at what we've done now in field one five, after we've on that 100 pounds per million MAP treatment, we've actually put 300 pounds of MAP in there over the last less than 10 years. Uh, and on the 200 is 600 pounds of MAP per acre in there. And we went to three inches this time this year. So we're, if we're seeing if it's just staying in the top and it is, and we're actually moving the soil test rate uh, number just a bit higher. Uh, the ones I showed you before were we're like 5.2 or whatever. Now in that surface, we're, we're moving it higher. So we, if we're gonna get a response, it should be, this is what your fertilizer dealer would tell you, this would give you a response. Uh, when I look at that 6,000 pounds, you'll hear people at meetings saying, well, you don't need to put phosphorus fertilizer on because you got enough for thousands of years. So let's do the math. Uh, we have 6,000 pounds out there, showed you that number. And we remove, if you're selling your product, we remove 15 to 41 pounds the acre every year of P or 45 to 123 pounds of P205, which is what you find in MAP. That's what that number is. Uh, so the MAP needed would be 88 to 241 pounds to replace what you've sold. And now we think we should run through the cattle and not sell that off the, off the land, but that's another discussion. If we did that and continue to send our phosphorus to China like we do right now uh, and didn't use any phosphorus, we would, we would last about 600 years. And the reality wouldn't last that long because you can't really, uh, you really can't use it all. So <clears throat> this is a very in-depth study. We're gonna put a PowerPoint up. Uh, when we start getting more data, we're going to put a PowerPoint up with a voiceover so it shows you all the data because there's just a mountain of data there you can't do in a format like this. So with that, I'd be willing to take questions. So um, the first question we have is, um, what are some of the practices that people can use to manage P to minimize runoff uh, to surface water? Uh, the number one thing would be to not broadcast your nutrient and especially not broadcast it in the fall. And I know there's a lot of nutrient that goes on in the fall like that. Uh, it's better off to be put into the soil and it's better to be put in the soil close to the seed where the root can find it. The, the highest requirement for phosphorus is early in the in the season, we call it specific uptake. The amount of uptake per inch of root is highest right there at the beginning. And so if you can put a little bit of phosphorus there, your root will be able to take that up and then it makes a relationship with these mycorrhizal fungi and then your root becomes extremely large. And I guess I didn't talk about that, but the mycorrhizal fungi basically multiply your root system many, many, many fold. And I like to ask people a question if, if they've seen a tree growing right out of rock in the Black Hills, how does it do that? And the answer is the mycorrhizal fungi in return for carbon are helping that thing get its nutrients. So uh, do no-till, put the phosphorus in the soil and then use the right amount, which can be quite a bit lower, we think, than what's recommended right now. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this study. We think we can actually run at much lower soil test levels than, than what you can in tilled systems where you don't have the mycorrhizal fungi that are as healthy. Um, the next question is, um, did you do any Haney tests in this trial? Uh, yeah, we've done all those. We've done the PFLAs and we do a, a yeah, we do all those. <laughs> but the Haney test is, uh, is you know, Bray uses a sodium bicarbonate. Uh, I mean, Bray uses a weak acid. Uh, Olson uses sodium bicarbonate. Uh, Haney uses a weak, a weak acid. So he pro he's about right in the middle between the two in terms of what it gives you for numbers. And the, the Haney test is fine. It just needs to be calibrated. The problem... I see right now with the Haney test for phosphorus is it hasn't been calibrated 
like all these other ones, the Olson and the Bray, where they're used, somebody has calibrated them. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions right now, um, so we can move on to our next speaker. All right, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Cody Zilverberg, and I work on the livestock integration and the uh, native species that we have here at the research farm. And my research is funded by the Dakota Lakes Farm Corporation, the NRCS cooperative agreement that we have, and uh, we have also money from the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. So the first question I want to address is this one. Why would we want to do this? <laughs> Why would we want to integrate livestock with our cropping systems? And that's because here at Dakota Lakes, we think of the farm as a biological system. And in that biological system, you have a lot of different cycles that we want to pay attention to. Energy cycle, water cycle, mineral cycle. And when we design a farming system, we want to look at the, the native system that was here and do our, the best we can to mimic that native system. And so in central South Dakota or across all of South Dakota, pretty much, of course, we had prairie. And on the prairie, we had a mixture of many different plant species. And pri primarily, those are going to be perennial grasses. But, you know, things growing at different times of the year with different root architectures and depths. And the way the prairie was harvested is not the way we typically harvest a, a grain field, which is, you know, where we remove a lot of material and send it off somewhere else. But rather, it was harvested by herbivores. And so the nutrients, the energy never went very far away. And those are important aspects then of the, the cycling of the energy, the cycling of the, the nutrients in that system. So, so we're really interested in using perennials in our farming systems as much as we can. And one of the particular reasons we like that is because they, with the perennials, they have this amazing root system oftentimes, not all of them, but oftentimes they have the very deep root systems and those root systems can oftentimes get down deep in the soil profile and bring nutrients up near the surface, cycle them back up near the surface in a way that our annual crops a lot of times can't do. And also because the roots are getting way down there, they may be able to draw down the water table, which of course has been uh, quite a problem in South Dakota recently, especially in the East. This photo was taken a couple years ago when we were in the middle of an extreme drought. And it's a, a mixture of switchgrass and big blue stem. So it just the, the amazing kind of growth we got out of this plant species in a drought is just a, a testament to why we want to incorporate these as much as we can. This slide shows a picture of uh, our cattle grazing on a switchgrass field. This is one another example of how we're using the perennials. In this case, this field is in a rotation where we have about five years or maybe a little more of the perennial. And then we rotate back into annual cropping for about 15 years. We also have perennials, of course, in uh, because with our livestock on a prayer on native pasture systems. And this is a field that we got a few years ago, or I should say a pasture we got a few years ago that was dominated mostly by crested wheatgrass. That's a non-native, an exotic cool season grass. And so we're trying different techniques, uh, both herbicide and and uh, seeding and changing our grazing management to try to transition this field away from those exotic grasses back to more of our native uh, tall grass species, the, some of which would have been present here. And so back to this question again, why integrate livestock with crops? Another answer to that question is to add biological and econ economic diversity. Because when, once we are able to utilize forage crops and perennials in our rotations, that, that's the, the biological diversity aspect of it. And of course, we could put those in even if we don't have livestock. But if we have livestock, now we can use the livestock to harvest those. And we've added some economic diversity too, because we're able to sell the, the livestock. This slide shows another answer to that question. And what it's demonstrating is if we take a calf and we feed that calf for six months and we put him in the feedlot, or we keep him on our land, grazing on our land, how much nutrients, uh, how much organic matter are we going to remove from the land to have to feed that calf? And so you look at these numbers and you see there's a clear advantage to wanting to 
keep that animal on your land. So because of all these things, we present ourselves with this challenge, which is to say, how long can we keep our animals and the nutrients that they eat on our land? And now I'm going to run through a few of the ways that we're trying to do that here at Dakota Lakes. This slide is showing you pictures of a, a stand of perennial grasses where we have interseeded uh, peas and oats and barley, that sort of thing. So we've got a lot of annual forages interseeded into the perennial. Here's an example of where we are actually grazing a standing forage crop. And this is a field that's in a rotation where we have grain crops here as well. But in this particular year, it was designated for forage. Here's another dry land field, just like the previous one. And what we've done on this field is, this is, uh, we, we're doing two forage crops. So the first forage crop was baled and the bales were removed and we put plant the second crop right away. And so then when we bring the cows onto the field, they're actually grazing the second crop while it's standing and we're feeding the bales to them at the same time. So we're keeping all those nutrients and all that biomass, that organic material on the field where it originated from. Now a big part of our livestock integration here is keeping the cattle on the fields during the winter too. And so one of the things we do there is to typically following a wheat harvest, we plant a cover crop and we swap that cover crop in the fall. And then we put the cows on that and they graze that throughout the winter. So we just leave the swaths lying on the ground. We move fences on, uh, well, every day we move fences to allocate a little bit more of that swath to them. And of course we get snow and that really rarely is that a problem. The cows, they know where the swath is. So they don't have to go searching all over the place to find it. They know where it is. They get their nose under it and they just follow along. And once in a while, if we do get crusting, we'll run over top of it with a four wheeler or something to break through that crust. Once we do that, the cows are able to get in there and, and graze on that swath. So during the time that we have cows on those on the crop fields, this is what our, our soil would typically look like. And in fact, you can't really see the soil here because it's covered up with our, what we would call our armor that came from the wheat crop, the residue from the wheat crop before. And so the, the hooves are actually not really even making contact with the soil surface. They're really just landing on this residue. And then in the spring, you know, when things warm up and maybe we have some wetter weather, uh, and the, the, the soils thaw out, we may move the cattle off of the land for a little bit, off of the, the fields for a little bit, uh, just to, until that moisture can uh, infiltrate into the ground. And, and then we can bring the cows back on a little bit later so we don't uh, tear up the land. So there's the challenge again. How long can we keep our animals and the nutrients that they eat on our land? That's what we're working towards here at Dakota Lakes. And with that, I will stop and I'll take any questions you guys may have. So Cody, um, we do have one question. Uh, what has been the most economical cover crop blend for winter grazing that fits all the soil health parameters and produces quality nutrition for cattle grazing in the early winter? That's a, a big question, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of parameters. And I think that the, the answer to that one is going to you know, depend on a particular situation. But you know, if we're going to uh, wheat, for instance, we'll probably put a lot of broadleafs in that cover crop because of the, the diversity that we want in that rotation. But if we're, the, the typical way that we do our winter grazing is as I described with the the swath, swaths, and so that's that's following the wheat, and it's going to like corn or soybeans, for instance. And so those with those particular mixtures, we typically they're pretty heavy on the oats and barley, so we've got a lot of grass in there. So we're putting a lot of a, a lot of organic matter into that cover crop, and so that's you know one way we're fitting into the the soil health parameters. Also, it's adding diversity to our rotation because we're not growing oats or or barley uh, grain crops there. And those mixes will typically also have some peas, maybe some lentils, uh, 
there might be a little bit of a brassica or something in there. Uh, but and so so we do get a little bit of diversity, maybe five species or so, but we've got them they're really heavily dominated by the grasses. And the quality of that is good. It's you know, it's not say off the charts, but it's it's adequate in terms of protein for our animals' needs, which are relatively high at that time of year because our cows are fall calving cows. So they're lactating as you know as we're going into that early winter season. So uh, it is grass dominated. And in terms of economics, uh, because we swath graze, we are, you know, we save the, the money, tip, mostly swath graze. And we do a little bit, I've got a bale in this picture, I should point out, we do do, we do bale a little bit and that's handy to have around in certain situations. Um, you know, if we have to take the cows off the field in the spring or maybe in a storm or something, but, uh, but typically, yeah, they're just grazing on the ground. So we save the cost of the baling and hauling the bales off the field and hauling the bales to the cows and all that. So we, so that is the economical thing. You know, grazing corn residue, of course, is economical too, but the quality is not as good as on these swaths. And we do, we do both, actually. We do both at the same time, so the cows have a choice of each. So having the, the, the corn residue there is uh, kind of complements those swaths. And because the swaths are bringing up the nutritional value of the overall diet. And we do feed a little bit of grain to them as well, a little supplement. Some of that is a meal that we have pressed here on farm from our oil seed. You know, it could be soy meal, flax meal, or something else. And so uh, from the economic perspective, uh, another thing, you could graze it standing. Uh, you could graze these cover crops as a standing crop. And we did a little bit of that last year in the same field where we swathed. We just left a little bit of it standing to see what would happen. And the quality, the quality was similar between the two, not no, no big differences, but, and, and you save money, of course, if you don't have to run the swather across the field too. But the, and, it, and they think they probably worked equally well uh, early on in the fall, but but then once we did get a lot of snow on top, then the problem becomes, you know, say we have a, we have a 20 foot swather. And so when you swath all 20 feet and then you condense it into a windrow that's only two or three feet wide, the cow doesn't have to search for all that. You know, she can get a mouthful right there. And when you leave it standing, you save some money, but it becomes much more difficult for the cow to access that once you get it covered up with snow. And so those are, those are uh, some of the, to, to answer the question, you know, from the, our experiences here on the research farm, that's, that's what I can tell you. Um, if you were in a wetter climate, do you think one or the other would work better or both would be fine as well? Are we one or the other of the standing crop versus the swaths? Yeah. In a wetter climate. Like if you had a lot of moisture on those ba on those swaths, do you think that would be a concern or? Right, right. Okay. Well, we, you know, last summer we did uh, swath. We did a little bit of swath grazing during the summer. And uh, not surprisingly, and, and we got moisture then too, you know, we got some rain on it. And it's not surprising that with the heat and the moisture, the quality of those swaths went down pretty fast. Now, but in contrast to that, when we're talking about this winter grazing, we're, we're usually swathing this around the time when it's gonna freeze. And so, under those conditions, you know, with those really cool temperatures, you know, it's kind of like putting it in the refrigerator or the freezer, we're conserving it a lot better. And so if you're, as you get to those, those freezing temperatures, the moisture, I think, becomes less of an issue because the microbial activity is not going to be uh, near as much. Okay, and, and 
There was a question also about do cattle need supplement in a grazing system? You did go over that, but I don't know if you wanted to retouch on that or if you call, mm -hmm. covered all that. Do cattle need supplement in a grazing system? Well, uh, you know, there are an infinite number of grazing systems and I, you know, in the, the ideal ones, the answer to that would probably be no. Uh, but in most systems, I think the answer to that is going to be yes. So if they're getting a diversity of forages, they may be able to meet all of their, their mineral and nutrient needs, you know, with a, a diversity of forages. But, uh, you know, the more, the more we tend towards monoculture as a single species or a few species, the more likely they are to miss out on something that they need. And, and so that's kind of from, say, a, a minerals perspective. But if we're talking about performance in terms of, you know, how much the milk they're able to produce, how much weight they're going to gain on a daily basis, uh, then, you know, we need to make sure we've got an adequate amount of crude protein. And then and pretty much the more energy, the, the better if you're trying to maximize weight gain. And so uh, under those circumstances, we are rarely going to have, I mean, only the very best forages are going to provide really high weight gains. And so depending on what your target weight gain is, you may need to add some energy supplementation. Or uh, if you're grazing cows on, for instance, uh, dry cows who don't have high energy requirements, but, you know, they still have some basic uh, minimum requirements. And there are times when our forages uh, even then, maybe low in crude protein, like if you're grazing dormant range in the winter or something, uh, even you probably are going to need some protein supplement too. So, uh, yeah, the answer to that one is going to change a lot depending on the situation. Okay, thank you, Cody. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's a good thing to be muted sometimes, especially towards the end of the day, but I finally found the um kind of finally found the thing uh i'm going to finish up with a little session on on the long-term effects of crop rotation if there's one thing we're probably known for at dakota lakes it's it's the work we've done with with crop rotations and um the videos on the web that they put up are probably as good as anything we've ever seen on on crop rotations it's it's uh excellent so i'm kind of redid this a little bit today and took some stuff out that i i didn't think was necessary anymore so uh commonality amongst tillage tools all tillage tools destroy soil structure all tillage tools decrease water infiltration all tillage tools reduce organic matter and all tillage tools increase weeds. And we have data for all of that. So when we came to Dakota Lakes in 1990, we had a board of directors of 11 members that were all tillage guys and all irrigators. And we had a discussion and Ralph Holsworth, who was president at the time said, I know how to farm with tillage. I don't know how to no-till. So let's just, just no-till and and get it over with. And so that's kind of what we did. Um, and I think we're happy that we did that. What we've done is created this soil armor with these macro pores that let water go in the ground. Um, very quickly, we put two inches of water on in nine minutes and don't get any runoff with our irrigators. And, and when we get big rain, uh, rainstorms, if, if the soil has room, the water goes in. And a big key to that's the macro pores. Some of those Macropores are made by roots and some are made by animals and some are made by these earthworms. And I've lost a lot of pins by sticking them in those, those holes, but it's always um, interesting to people who come to, to go look at that. One of the first things we noticed about some of our land, even when we were still at Redfield, when we irrigated we didn't get the deep wheel tracks and we'd started as charlie said to try to stop runoff under irrigation and we did that and then as a consequence we also stopped a big real uh, uh, wheel tracks from the irrigators and also from the machines as we get 
further down the road, we just don't worry about tracking up field very much anymore. A um, few places, and especially if we have our skinny tires on the sprayer, but other than that, it's, it's uh, pretty easy. Try to keep living roots in the soil as much as possible by using cover crops, but we're very cognizant of not uh, bringing diseases across. So our idea here was to take the E out of ET. Sam talked about evapotranspiration. If you're doing cover crops, you're using water to make some biomass and, and sequester some nutrients and whatever. That's a, the T part. The evaporation part is when it evaporates off the soil. And if you don't have something growing there and you have no cover there and it's dark, then you lose that water to, to evaporation and doesn't do you any good. And so if we can make the water enter the soil and take the E out of ET, which I say a lot of times, and, and then increase the water holding capacity of the soil by adding more organic matter, then all of a sudden we've created a better system for crop productivity. And I think we've done that at Dakota Lakes. And that's why those soils look so good is because we've done that. A small amount of organic matter by weight has a big impact on pore space because organic matter is light, so it fluffs the soil up. One of my favorite examples is if people build a house and they put a sidewalk in and they always have the lawn about four or five inches lower than the sidewalk. And they plant their grass and they come back in five or seven years of grass there and the grass is now higher than the sidewalk. So it's puffing that soil up and that means it holds more water, it's more space. Uh, these are important under irrigation. Like I said, we started with the main goal of being irrigation way back in the 80s. By the time we got here in 1990, we'd switched. Uh, but they're just absolutely imperative for dryland farming here because if you don't get the rainfall and you don't use your water well, then you just don't get crops. And that's why people were doing in this country, wheat and summer fallow was a predominant rotation before we started doing these better ways of taking care of our soils and our, and our water. Uh, these videos that we have will go around the dry land looking at different uh, crop rotations on the videos and so I'm going to show you what those rotations are and then you can match them up with, with what's on the videos. Um, we had initially on a dry land basis, we started with a rotation initially that was 50% low residue crops. And we partially did that because the wheat breeders wanted to work on conditions that gave them challenges for winter hardiness. So they thought we should do tillage. I said, I can give you challenges without doing tillage. So we, we had a rotation as winter wheat, soybeans, corn, and then either a pea or a flax. And we did that from 1990 to 2014. And it, about seven years before that, the wheat breeders quit working there because they got tired of losing their wheat every year. So we did a good job. Uh, we switched this five years ago. Uh, this is a soil that has a real platy structure and you'll see that in the videos and how bad it is. And we'll, we'll look at it where it's actually been planted to switch grass because what we decided to do is switch that to a three-way rotation, winter wheat, corn, pea, or flax, or canola, that three-way ecofallow type rotation, and then a five-year perennial. So we have 15 years of that, five times through that three-way rotation, and then five years of perennials. So as I told Cody, when we started this in, in 20 years, which now it's only 15 years, uh, in 20 years, we'll have good information. And that's one of the things that a farmer-owned farm can do that you can't do with a government-owned farm. You'll never have that kind of commitment to long-term uh, research. So you'll see that in the video. It's very striking. In the video, I think you'll, you'll see that. We had this eco rotation, which is the one that we now do with the perennial sequence. And we have done it since 1990 with this winter wheat corn oil seed or winter wheat sorghum pea or something like that. And we do both of these uh, on the north side of the farm uh, in that, in kind of in that order. We make it a six way, which gives us a six year split to peas and, and six year split to canola. So 
It's basically that style of rotation. I call it eco rotation because uh, Gail Wex and, and Fenster, Charlie Fenster, started doing that in Nebraska and Kansas with winter wheat, sorghum, and fallow, where they actually worked the fallow and came back in, and they called it eco -fallow. We stole that from them. In the videos, I'll talk about stealing stuff from everybody. We stole that from them, took the tillage out, and substituted a cool season broadleaf there. In 20 years, we'll have a comparison then between an eco fallow type two thirds, 66% high residue crop is what you see here, with and without a perennial sequence. And if you go through the math on that one with the perennial sequence at that time, the 20 years before we get there would have been 75% high residue crops because that, that switchgrass is a high residue crop. So we had one that's 50% that failed. We got one that's 66% like this, it's okay. Uh, we'll have one like this at 66% plus that five year sequence, which will be uh, like a 75 or 80, depending on what you count. And then we have the one that we've done um, uh, for almost uh, uh, 30 years. We had to wait until we got freedom to farm, which was in the 90s in order to do this one exactly, but we did it as a 75% with a, a spring wheat, winter wheat, sorghum, sunflower type thing. And then we've added a second warm season grass. So we got a spring or winter cereal as the first year, winter wheat as the second year, uh, sorghum third year, corn fourth year, and one single broadleaf for 80% of, of the crops are high residue. And you'll see that one very distinctly when you see that one in the film you've got earthworms and you got big roots hanging out the bottom of that winter wheat we dug up some winter wheat in that field and it's it's a very distinct thing so that'd be one for you to look for but we noticed this stuff was happening took about 10 years almost to really start picking it up and we came here in 1990 started doing these rotations 10 years later 2002 we had a really dry year and the wheat in the higher residue rotation down here at the bottom, uh, the three-way rotation, 75% out yields the one on the 50% uh, by, by almost double, or just exactly double. Now we had 6.4 inches of rain in that 24, or in that 12 months from the time we harvested the peas till we harvested the winter wheat. Very dry year in 2002. Into 2005 was still almost a double, not quite, in a wetter year. And then 2006, again, when it was dry again, uh, we doubled the yield when we got 7.9 inches that year. And, and it's very distinct, it's very visual. Here's the low residue rotation wheat. Here's the high residue rotation wheat. Here it is from an aerial infrared thing, the low residue stuff's on the right and the bottom, the high residue stuff's on the left at the top. Uh, very, very distinct. And we can count on that happening. It's harder to plant those fields. It's harder to get the winter wheat to survive in those fields. If we had blowing, which we really haven't had now in several years, but 10 years ago, we still had some stuff blowing when we had big wind in the spring. And that would always be that set of fields that was in that low residue rotation. We have similar things in the dry land. I'll just show you yield data. You'll see the dry land. You'll see the our three dry land, ro I mean, our three irrigated rotations. Uh, I'll just kind of go through this real fast. Corn, soybean rotation, we average about 63 bushel the acre for soybeans. If I do a corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, uh, that extra kick in there has given us about 78.8 bushel between the average on those two. So better yields by having a crop rotation. We see the same thing with corn that we have a field that's been continuous corn since 1990 and the soil structure and whatever in there is excellent, but it's corn on corn. So it won't yield quite as good. 203 bushel, 217 in corn soybean. We still have a field of corn soybean and you'll see that soil. And then we have this more diverse rotation of corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean where those two corns together, first year corn's better than the second year one. The second year one's about equivalent to the corn soybean. 
And if I do the math on that, that's in the 5,000 acres, if you had 5,000 acres to, of land to farm, this is the numbers you're gonna get. Um, million bushels of corn and the biggest dryer in the country, if you do continuous corn. But there's the other one, and, and we're, we're doing irrigated wheat one year in that diverse rotation. So again, if I look at that and you do the math, does it make sense to trade 72,500 72, bushels of corn for 120,000 bushels of wheat? Well, that's pretty easy. And then you get 350 bushels more of soybean and you have way less pest issues. You don't have to worry about resistant weeds and resistant uh, corn rootworm beetle and all that kind of stuff. And you, you save a lot of money on technology. So doing the right thing environmentally is almost always the correct approach in the long run. And I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, with what's happening this year, it, this chasing stuff and, and exporting nutrients and all the things we've been doing in the, in the name of progress, I'm not sure we shouldn't rethink that just a little bit and try to look at the, the system a little bit better. And we always like to finish with the take the E out of ET, make all the water go through your plants, get it in the soil, capture it on the ground, get it in the soil, get it through your plant, do something beneficial with it, uh, like Sam talked about. And a lot of people say, well, we can't do that, we can't do that, we can't do that. And the guys at Codelex Research Farm, because they gave me this canvas on which to paint, we were allowed to really test these goofy ideas and, and we found out that we can do these things in Central South Dakota, so we've taken the tea out of camp. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to do this today. We'd have rather had you here. We got through the whole thing without a rain outside, uh, but I would be willing to take questions. I think our other people are here too, so we can all take questions as they arise. But make sure you check out those videos. They're excellent. The only problem I had with the videos, if you look at them, is they didn't have the skinny the skinny lens on for me, but they did for Cody and Sam, but they forgot to put it on in my stuff, so. So um, we did have a question submitted. Um, why does it seem that where tillage is most prevalent are the in the wettest and the driest climate areas? Well, you know, we've done this. We started doing this actually at Redfield with some people would call the wettest and we were successful there. And, and we were actually successful on that Lake Dakota Plain. I think it really comes down to somebody has to, uh, we use, we use no-till on our real heavy clay soils up north, north, which people say you can't do that either. And I think it's a matter of committing, committing to making that work and then try to figure out how to do it, there's not really a, a recipe as such to make that thing work. And it's a, a matter of, of principles and, and trying to figure out how it fits. I think in the dry areas, you know, the, the middle part of the state in South Dakota, to be fair, I mean, if we, we became a corn belt because we just need to save just a little bit of water to become a corn belt. If you're way out where you get way less water than that, you're not going to become a corn belt. So they can't copy what we're doing. The, the toughest place, I think personally, to try to do the no-till thing would be in a cool tall grass prairie that's that way because it's cool. So that would be like the Northern Red River Valley or something. But that's going to take being doing the perennials and even what we're doing. And I think everybody's going to have to do perennial eventually. To, to bring these nutrients back to the surface. That deep rooted perennial we're putting in and we're doing the same thing on the irrigated now putting a perennial sequence in, in one of our rotations on the irrigated so we can bring the lime and, and, and gypsum and the sulfur and those kind of things back to the surface and leave them there. What we've done with annual cropping is we've let those go out the bottom and they either go to drain tile and in, in into the Mississippi River system or the Red River system, or, you know, or they just, they go into the aquifer if they go deep 
and and we we've, we've got to cycle them up. We got pHs dropping and those kind of things, and now we're bringing in lime and and Sam and I were looking at some soil samples earlier today, and, and there's free lime and gypsum all over down there at four feet. So there's no reason for us not to bring it up. So I, to answer it, that in a short manner is you've got to look at your nutrient cycles, like Cody said, and try to match the, the nutrient cycles. And people really want to maximize, a lot of times just want to maximize how much cash we can get. And a lot of people don't want to goof with livestock, but the the livestock the thing we're doing with the livestock thanks to the buffett foundation the thing we're, we're doing with the livestock is we're trying to automate some of this stuff because nobody wants to do li livestock because it's too much work and it's too much work for us right now too but we're trying to get it so we can automate it a bit and use our technology to to allow that animal to do more what the animal's designed to do and then i think you can do it anywhere um, Dwayne, the first question is, do you like the corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean rotation better than a corn, corn, soybean, wheat rotation? Don't know yet. Uh, we do have a corn, corn, soybean, wheat rotation as well, which gets at 75%. I think it's going to be, I do think that that's going to be the case uh, from a soil standpoint that we'll like the double double corn uh, bean wheat rotation from that standpoint better, but whether that two year break to corn is enough, I don't know. And so uh, we always like to joke when somebody asks a question like that is, is that's why it says research on the sign because we, we don't know yet, but we're in our like fourth year of, of that four way rotation. And what we did there is just take out one of the soybeans. So, um, another question is, what annual crops work best when taking perennial pasture out? <laughs> well, we're trying to figure that out too, but we're going we're gonna to try on when we're taking out our switchgrass this year, we're going to try to do it by coming to winter wheat, which we've normally used we've normally used peas. And I've always liked doing it with peas um, because you have a crop that likes to grow in the cool part of the year and, and so it'll get off and get started well and, and it's got a big seed so it'll come all through all that residue and, and those kind of things. So if you're talking a true perennial pasture, we would probably say peas or lentils, uh, peas or soybeans. And Roundup Ready soybeans were a good trick for doing that at one time, and probably still are. Uh, we're gonna try to do it by going to wheat this year, so that'll be an interesting one to watch. Some farmers use a practice called strip till. Is this too much tillage for the soil structure issues? Well, the problem with strip till, and we did, if you're old enough, we did strip till at Redfield in the 80s. And there were several farmers and I that did that. I think the problem, the problem with strip till lies more in the, yeah, it's too much tillage if you do the tillage part, but there's data that shows it's not really the tillage, it's the fertilizer placement that's the issue. And we have some guys here, even some of our board members that are doing, placing their fertilizer kind of low disturbance uh, before they plant. And for me, it seems like that's not the most efficient thing to do as far as timing. Now the true strip till where they do the tillage, if you do that in any kind of slope, you have erosion. You have big gullies forming and that's a problem, especially if you're going up and down the hill. So that's, that's kind of become a no-no. My, my problem with strip till from a management standpoint is if I get my fertilizer all out there, and we had tons of people that did this a year ago, they had their nitrogen fertilizer out there in the fall before last year turned off wet in the spring and and they're out there with a bunch of fertilizer dollars that they wasted because it's there and it's not only wasted it's probably causing degradation to the ecosystem so we don't when you, you talk that right time and you talk the right place both of those strip tills has issue with it's not the right time 
necessarily. And then the right place, if they, if they get one of their openers moves a little bit, they can get too close to that band and actually kill their seed. So we've had that happen where a guy goes back out and has to plant one row, one row of corn everywhere where he's got 18 rows or 24 rows. And, and so we just thought it was, we got a dry year at Redfield when we did it. And then we had to decide whether we wanted to plant the corn where the moisture was or where the fertilizer was. And, and we kind of, you know, there were some farmers involved in that too. And we all looked at each other and said, well, this is stupid. And so we, we kind of went away from that right away. And it also causes more weeds. So I can show you all these things. I mean, the disturbance you do causes weeds to grow different times than where you've got the residue. So then you've got two flushes of weeds instead of one. So there's a lot of things we didn't like about the strip till. You got more machinery than you need. So, and yeah, the disturbance might be a bit much, but it's a lot of these other things that are the problem. Oh, and then we have another question. What is the shortest period you can add perennials and still see benefits? Well, I'm not qualified to answer that. We're using five, which is probably about as short as it can be. I think under irrigation, we're going to do those in four. And, and, and we'll know more. Well, somebody will know more. <laughs> we hope we get a new manager that likes all these questions. Um, we're going to know more in a few years because we're, we're going to see what happens with, with the nutrients coming up under that irrigation thing. It's got to get the roots all the way down to where they need to be and they need to function for a while. And I think if you're in an area that has, like Cody talked about, that water table, that's a real problem, might take a few more years. But I know that they're using perennials in Jimmer Valley to clean up a lot of the sodic and saline type problems. And, and that it's really a water cycle issue, a lot of it. And, and we can't really cycle water the way we need to if all we use is is annuals. Um, in Australia, Ruth and I were in Australia a year and a half ago. I've been there before that a few times. But they take out big tall trees and try to replace it with a wheat plant. I mean, it's not even close and it, it, it goes away pretty quickly. So that's all the questions we have for today. Um, we all want to thank everybody who um, attended today. We really appreciate the attendance. Thank you to all those technical people behind the scenes that did this huge job of putting this together in the videos. They did a great job. We really appreciate everything you guys did. And, and thanks to all the presenters who joined us today. Remember, um, the recording of this will be available at the SDSU Agricultural Experiment Station website next week. And um, that site is sdstate.edu backslash AES. Um, so we hope if you have questions, you know, feel free to email the people here. Uh, we have a Facebook page. And again, thank you to everyone. Hopefully next year we'll be able to see you in person. <laughs>